Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning, our scripture text is taken from 1 Samuel, and I'm going to start reading 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, and then I'll jump over to chapter 17 and verse 3. Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, 13 says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And then again, starting at verse 3. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, while Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with the valley between them. Then a champion came out from the armies of the Philistines, named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was clothed with scale armor, which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. He also had bronze greaves on his legs and a bronze javelin slung between his shoulders. And the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And the head of his spear weighed 600 shekels of iron. His shield carrier also walked before him, and he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel and said to them, Why do you come out to draw up in battle array? Am I not the Philistine and you servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will become your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. Again, the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Pray with me. Lord, it's a natural thing for us to be dismayed and greatly afraid. That was the the first emotion that, that Adam ever, ever verbalized. He told God, I hid for I was afraid. Lord, there's a lot of that going around these days. I ask for your power, your strength, this day and in the days to come. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I read that back in 2001, Yale University did a study. And in this study, they discovered that bad hair days really do exist. Did you know that? Bad hair days really do exist. That in the morning when people can't get their hair to cooperate with them, that those are the mornings that they feel less capable, less smart, less sociable, and have lower self-esteem than they do the days that they can get their hair to cooperate. An interesting thing about this study was also that men have more bad hair days than women do. So women, if you see a man with a bad hair day, please tread lightly. So why in the world do I bring this up? It's because Israel had a lot of bad hair days when the Philistines were around. They were a warrior culture that, that sailed from Crete to the to the shores of Israel, they were a more advanced culture. Their technology and metallurgy 
was much more advanced when, than the Israelites, and so they wreaked havoc, and they stayed in the Israelites' hair all the time. It was about 1100 B.C., and the Philistines figured out that if they could control the Elah Valley, they could split Israel in two, divide and conquer the whole of the country. So they start coming down the, the south side. The, the Elah Valley had, had two very steep mountains, and they start coming down the, the south side. Well, that's when Saul, the king of Israel, got word that the, the Philistines were coming down the south side of the, the Elah Valley. So the, the armies of Israel began coming the north side of the Elah Valley, and when they met each other, they knew that the, the first one that rushed down to fight would be at a disadvantage that the one who waited would be fighting downhill and, and probably defeat the other. So instead of rushing to fight, the, the two armies stood on the mountain and they shouted at each other. <laughs> well, a war was never won with harsh words, but they sure did try. And they sat there they're just shouting back at each other. And that's when the Philistines sent out their secret weapon. His name was Goliath. And I read the, the, his, the, the weight in shekels of his armor and the, the, his height in cupids and spans. And I was trying to put it all together to, to give us a picture of what it might be like to, to, to see Goliath down there. Imagine Shaquille O'Neal and add just a touch of Arnold Schwarzenegger and then add two feet and now clothe him in sheet metal. That's what Goliath was like. Goliath was down there every morning and every evening taunting, taunting the armies of Israel, daring anyone to come down and fight him. Well, on one of those mornings, there was a, a shepherd boy, the youngest of seven sons. He came to deliver lunch to his brothers. He's listening to Goliath down there in the valley, shouting these taunts, daring anyone to come down to him. And he turns to the soldiers around him and said, well, when are you going to man up and go down there and slay him? Well, you don't turn to a bunch of warriors and tell them they need to man up. Well, it, it killed morale, hurt their feelings. So they did what soldiers sometimes do. They went to the king and they tattled. They said, Saul, I, here's this boy, and he's telling us to, to, to man up, and, and it hurt our feet. Make him stop. So Saul called David to his tent and said, David, oy vey. or he said something like that anyway. He said, you, you're killing morale. You, you need to just lay off it a little bit. Their technology of the, of the Philistines is so much greater than ours. I, we're lucky just to, to have an army that'll stand and fight against them. And now you're, you're, you're taking the heart, the morale right out of them. David says, that's not what I intended to do at all. I'll go down there and I'll slay him. That's when Saul looks at him. And it must have been a, a, a look like, ah, poor David, he doesn't know what he's getting into. He said, David, he's been a warrior his whole life. He was born, he was raised in a warrior culture. He's been training his whole life to fight while you've been tending sheep. You could never prevail. And that's when David, David says, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the bear will certainly deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Thaw says, Okay, so Saul, the king, gives him his own helmet. He gives him his own armor, and he gives him his own sword. Well, David can't walk around with that. So he says, I'll take my stick. I'll take my bag. I'll take my sling. He walked down, and in the brook he gathered five smooth stones, and the first one, he threw it at Goliath, and, and it hit Goliath squarely in the forehead and knocked him down. David ran and got Goliath's sword and slayed Goliath. You like that story? <laughs> of course you do. 
It's one of the most well-known stories in, in all of history. Over 3,000 years old, and still it's, it's passed down, it's told. And so often we, we, we love the story because it's an underdog story. And yes, it is an underdog story. But if we see it only as an underdog story, we've missed the point. It's not about the power of the underdog. The story is about the power of God and what God can do through ordinary people. And there are a few things in this story that that we need to know, and that's what I want to talk about this morning, things to know, things to know in this story. And the first thing we need to know is that Goliath is big, but our God is bigger. The beginning of World War I, the Germans launched a a new technology, or at least they began to perfect it. It was a technology of a submarine. They called them U-boats. And they began to sink ships left and right, both British ships and American ships. And the American sailors discovered, or the American Navy discovered something that that they didn't, didn't know, that Once the men were were put into the lifeboats, that it was about a week before men began to die. And what surprised them, that that it wasn't those that were older and weaker, that the ones that died first were most often those that were younger and stronger. And they began to research the problem. And what they discovered was that the older sailors, either they had been on a ship that had sunk before, and they knew that they had hope of being rescued, or they had a friend, they knew someone directly that had been on a ship that had sunk before, and that had been rescued. And this is what it says. It says, simply knowing that they'd been saved before reinforced the will to live. And that's exactly, that's exactly what David does here. He, he, he remembers, he practices, he rehearses what God has done before. Verse 37 says, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. So often it is that we face the giants in life, we face the adversity, we face the the hardship, the heartache. And instead of rehearsing, instead of practicing, instead of going over God's faithfulness, instead of practicing His goodness, instead of remembering His help, we have a tendency instead to, to practice tragedy to rehearse the the size and the weight of the giant, to go over again and again his strength and the power of his sword. We're in a difficult time. I don't need to tell anybody that. We're in a a time where we're facing facing a a giant, And, and there's no minimizing the size of this pandemic. It's hard. But it hasn't caught God off guard. I want to invite you to know, yes, that, that, that Goliath is big, but our God is bigger. Rehearse his faithfulness. Remember his help and practice his goodness. Because God's greatest work, well, it's done through ordinary people. Through ordinary people like 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 you and me. Things to know. Know that Goliath is big, but our God is bigger. And the second thing that I want to talk about this morning, uh, under things we need to know, know that you have strengths. Verse 38 and 39, this is what it says. It says, Then Saul clothed David with his garments and put a bronze helmet on his head. And he clothed them with armor. And David girded his sword over his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. So David said to Saul, I cannot go with these. 
for I have not tested them. And David took them off. This morning, I have a confession. And I realize that whenever a preacher says that they have a confession, that people lean in just a little bit. And, and this is a true confession. And my confession is this. For the longest time, I did not understand why the Tenth Commandment was one of the commandments at all. It just it didn't make sense to me for the longest time. I mean, I understood why thou shalt not murder is in there. Yeah, it, 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 no bueno. You, 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 to take someone's life, it's obviously wrong. Thou shalt not steal. It, it, to take someone's stuff, what the, it's obviously wrong. But the Tenth Commandment, thou shalt not covet. And then it goes through the things, thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thy neighbor's wife, thy neighbor's male or female servant, thy neighbor's ox. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's donkey. I've never coveted my neighbor's donkey. Uh, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. And I couldn't understand why. <laughs> our economy, our whole economy is built on coveting. Uh, every commercial is about, this is shiny and you don't have it, don't you want it? Why thou shalt not covet? And it was just a little while back that I discovered that, that when, we, when we kill, when we murder, we, we take the life of another. When we steal, we take the property of another. But when we covet, we aren't stealing or taking from another. We're robbing God. We're robbing God of of praise that is due him. We're robbing God of thanks that should be accorded to God. That when we look at, at, at that that belongs to our neighbor and say, I want that, then we aren't looking at what God has already given us. David's strength was his strength to, to not covet. His strength was a strength of spirit. Placed on his head was the best helmet in the whole of the kingdom. I mean, the king's not going to have a throwaway helmet. They're not going to you know, cast a, a sword from leftover metal that just happened to be laying around. No, it was going to be the finest sword in all the kingdom, and that was placed in David's hand. The finest armor in the whole of the kingdom, it was placed on David. And David didn't want it. Instead, he went to the gifts that God had already given him. He went to his stick. He went to his sling. That Saul, Saul and Goliath, they were infantry. That their power was in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And their power was in their sword and the length of the sword. Or, or if you got much farther than the length of their sword, a little farther out was their spear. And the, the javelin, they were accurate with when 150 feet. But David, David was a slinger. Slingers, they never got within 150 feet. The book of Judges said that a slinger, a, an excellent slinger, was accurate within 200 yards. And within 100 yards... Two to three times the, the distance that an infantryman would ever come to them. They could hit something the size of a coin. Goliath didn't stand a chance. Because David knew his strengths. He didn't covet that that belonged to the king. He didn't want that that belonged to someone else. God has given you strengths. Now the world will tell you different. The world will tell you that, that you're not enough, that you're not good enough, that you're not perfect enough, that you're not thin enough, you're not successful enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not smart enough, that you're not enough. But that's not what Scripture says. 
Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all your needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. What are the riches of God? I don't know, but I do know that they're more than enough. They're more than abundant. The riches of God are beyond all of our imagination. And the riches of God have been supplied to, to you and to me in glory in Christ Jesus. He's provided more than enough for you and for me. No, no, you have strength. And it's God's greatest work or is done through ordinary people who know their strengths. The third thing that I want to talk about, of the things that we need to know, know that, know that God will help. The first verse I read this morning was chapter 16, verse 13. It says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. All throughout the Old Testament, the, the Spirit of God, it was sprinkled on individuals. And that's key. That's a, that's a very important key. That the Spirit of God in the Old Testament was sprinkled on, on individuals. On David, right here, who was mighty in battle. The book of Judges says it is on those who had were wisdom. That was the Spirit of God. In the book of Exodus, those who were excellent craftsmen, who could work in wood or, or metals the way that no one else could, they, they knew that the Spirit of God was on that person. But the prophet Joel, the prophet Joel talked about a day where the Spirit of God wouldn't be sprinkled, it would be poured. And it would be poured out on sons and daughters. Well, that was unheard of. But Joel didn't, didn't stop there, that it would be poured out on the young and the old. And Joel didn't stop there. He talked about a day that it would be not only poured out on the sons and daughters, the young and old, that it would be poured out on slaves. You don't get more ordinary than a slave. Jesus Christ, He came not just to talk about pain and suffering and sorrow. He came not just to, to talk about the, the giants in this world. He came when pain and suffering and sorrow, when we face the, the greatest giants. He came not just to talk about them, but he, he came to take them on himself. And he nailed it to the cross to take away its power to conquer Pain, suffering, sorrow, death, and sin once and for all. And when he rose from the grave on the third day, he rose. He rose in order to, to pour out that power on all people. Sons and daughters, young and old, slave and free, male and female. To pour that power on you. And on me. This morning, I don't know where you are, but I do know that Jesus Christ has more than enough power, more than enough power to help you. I don't know what you're going through, but I do know that Jesus Christ has more than enough power. The power of His Holy Spirit living in you. It's His desire that, that that Holy Spirit make His home in your heart and begin to, to transform, to change you. Because God does His most extraordinary work through ordinary people who allow Him to make His, His home in your hearts. And I don't know if you've ever done that this before, but this morning I want to offer you that opportunity. Pray with me, if you will. Jesus, this day, may it be like none other. Grant us grace enough, power enough to receive your Holy Spirit. We see what you did through David. 
we see that he was able to, to face his giants. And Lord, I believe that there are folks out there that are facing giants that, well, that, that they made them dismayed and greatly afraid is the way that the soldiers of Israel felt. Lord, may we not respond from our feelings, but from what we know. That yes, those, those giants out there, they may be bigger. Goliath is big, but we know that you're bigger. Then we might not respond from our feelings, but we might respond from what we know. That you've given us strength. Strength. And it's, it's not what others have. The strength doesn't come with that we're not enough. The strength is that, that you supply all our needs in Christ Jesus. Lord, I know that there are folks that are they're feeling, feeling defeated. I know that there are folks that are feeling like they're facing the giants in this world and they don't have power. Lord, may we respond not in our feelings, but in what we know that your desire is to help and the strength and power of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, will you come and make your home in our hearts that your power, your power may prevail in our lives. We've lived this life long enough that we know and we've seen what we do under our own power and we know that it's not enough. But hope, the hope the hope of the world, it's, it's not in our power. The hope of the world, it's in you. Lord, come live your life through us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith, and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online. My hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.